Gordon's holiday parties, particularly Christmas, there was always a ferret, a kinkachu, various kinds of snakes. You had to have a strong stomach to go, but it was fun. It, it, it was a message, despite the illnesses, despite the tragedies, Gordon was alive. His cowboy boots. I always, always was jealous of his cowboy boots and used to tell him, when I get my doctorate, I'll be wearing better cowboy boots than you. <laughs> All the, the Western jewelry that he was famous for wearing, so the, the boots, the hat. We all got to know Gordon Derner when we were in, in the graduate program. Uh, he was very friendly and very curious and really interested in all of us. But I think the interesting thing about him is that even though he was so out there, he was also incredibly approachable. When I was a student, we used to go over to the, to the Derner's home. And as, I remember the, the third year case conference, we used to go there every Friday morning and sit there in front of the fire and have Margaret would bake cookies. Uh, there was a kinkachu that, you, that used to hang with us so that you couldn't touch it because it could bite. Um, there were snakes and uh, rabbits and I mean, there were just a lot of things. Gordon was an advisor in the Peace Corps and we'd come back from the trips he'd have the animals in his pocket. Those were the days. Well, I remember he always used to talk about being a barker in the circus at one point. You could look at him currently and really see that man. <laughs> that part hadn't left him that larger than, than life. It, it seemed to fit, it worked with him easily. Even though he was very pronounced and out there, he was not weird. <laughs> it was like, oh, that's Gordon and that's the way Gordon is. He was filled with life, he was robust, he was fun, he was a party himself. Wherever he was, there was a party. But he lived with tragedy. He and his wife, their first son died in childbirth, right after childbirth, cystic fibrosis. His second son survived with cystic fibrosis into his 20s, and they lived life to the fullest despite the tragedy. Of course, there was Gordon the psychologist, who was a, a powerful and dynamic person, and single-handedly changed clinical psychology. He founded this program that the APA said, you'll never get it approved. It's 20 years ahead of its time. And in fact, it was approved starting in 51, and it was approved in 1957. Derner, to me, was a, a, a visionary. He had a, had a vision of promoting psychoanalysis, promoting it through a university stand as opposed to a freestanding psychoanalytic institute. Uh, he was quite uh, a paternal figure to many of the students. In 1977, I was a 21 year old with very little professional experience, no real clinical knowledge uh, from a working class family. Uh, neither of my parents had college degrees. I was the first person in my extended family to go to graduate school. And I was the youngest person in my class. And I was scared to death. Gordon Derner embraced me and supported me without singling me out. At one point in the early 1970s, Little Adelphi had graduated more black clinical psychologists than any other program in the nation. He was deeply committed to that, but because of that, he was a controversial figure. Gordon Derner's program, the Derner Institute, now serves as a model for over half of the clinical psychology programs in North America. When I was here, we had approximately uh, four to six uh, African-American students and approximately four to six Hispanic. That was per class. So he made a commitment that was uh, highly un unusual. So by having come here to the Durham Institute, really opened up uh, tremendous professional avenues that would not have been available to me. Even more than Dr. Derner loved psychology, Gordon loved justice. And I had no idea that this white man in cowboy boots wearing silver was going to change my life so dramatically. Many people think that the way to deal with diversity is to pretend that everyone is the same. Gordon Derner said, we are different. We're really very different. Look at me. <laughs> And we should celebrate those differences. When I look back, I have um, great affection and a lot of gratitude for Dr. Turner 
and the effect that he's had on my life. But I had no idea that this was the person I would be thinking of more than 30 years later. I remember people feeling that this was home. Not only did he accomplish bringing people in, but he made everyone feel comfortable. And I know in my class, we didn't think twice about the diversity. We, we were the class. The context in which I learned psychology and really learned how to be a professional was one in which I was not alone. And that was um, by Gordon's design. We now have about 1,200 alumni from the program. And so many of our people have played a significant role in founding new organizations, in building them and in maintaining them. I think that what I learned at Adelphi and from Gordon, that finding the way you want to make a difference in the world is what's important. And I don't think I realized how much he had influenced my life until he was gone. How sad that makes me still. I called him, he was out in California, he and Margaret, and uh, he was excited to, you know, he always had a, a warmth when you met him. And the first thing he said to me was, you know, I just joined the Hemlock Society, and uh, I didn't quite know what it was, but he said, you know, if you join and you cremate it, it's only $200. But if you're not a member, it's $1,200. That's how the conversation began. Now, I had no idea that he was going to die the next day. And then we went on and we had a, a rather long a conversation about other issues, including death. And, you know, he said what many, many of us say is that as we get older, in some ways we still feel like we're 17. And I, I really had no idea how close he was to death because of so much li liveliness and enthusiasm. After he passed, Margaret uh, said to me that she had some stuff and. I should come over and take a look and take what I wanted. I did. And it's all very special. And I wear the ring sometimes, but it makes me sad. I saw Gordon Derner uh, see in us uh, our capability, our, our, our future. So the way that I teach students today, I don't teach them in terms of what they present, but in terms of what their possibilities are. I think that what really distinguishes the Derner Institute is that we are trained to see patients as human beings, as human beings we interact with, as human beings who have been going through a lot through their lives and who we should empathize with. I think the most meaningful experience for me so far has been the diversity of perspectives that my cohort, my classmates have brought. When we have a topic to talk about, there's 20 different perspectives, and I think all of them are valid. Whether I agree with them or not, I really appreciate that everybody can bring something to the table. Derner is helping me achieve my professional goals by simply having a little bit of everything. They have a great balance of academic work, clinical work, research experience, and I have the opportunity to kind of create my own individualized education plan. So I can pursue the opportunities that I want to that's going to help me do what I want to do in the future. The Durant Institute has changed tremendously and remained the same. Our focus is still on psychodynamic treatment. The research component of it has expanded in very, in very positive and, and productive ways. The enduring legacy is that he changed the face of clinical psychology both in terms of diversity and in terms of professional training. And, um, you know, we admire him for it. To say that it changed my life coming here would be an understatement. It transformed me.